Obviously, we've all got questions for God. But as it turns out, he's got questions for us too. Why these questions though? The whole month of May, we're not going to look at the questions we have for God, and I know we have tons of questions for God. I know some of the questions that I've heard uh, just in our community alone, one of the questions I seem to get all the time is, um, is people asking God, how come the Dodgers can't win a World Series? I don't know. Keep talking to God. Maybe he will tell you. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, But we want to spend the whole month of May looking at and unpacking four questions that we see God ask of people in the Bible. And why these questions, and what might uh, you and I wrestling with these questions, what might that teach us about who God is, Um, what might that teach us about others, and what might that teach us about ourselves? And so that's going to be the whole month of May. We're going to look at four questions um, over the whole month that God asks of us, and my hope is that we would leave with a deeper understanding of God, others, and ourselves when we unpack and lean into these questions. Uh, But there's a a saying um, that you are your own worst critic. And this is uh, so true for some of you that when people say nice things to you or about you, it's hard for you to actually believe them. I think many of us uh, maybe go around uh, just kind of wondering and waiting for everything to just fall apart. That if something doesn't go as planned, you immediately assume that it's your fault. But have you ever realized that not everyone else thinks this way? Why is that? And how do we come to believe the things that we do? And what happens if the way and what we're thinking is hurting us more than helping us? If you're taking notes, the title of our message this week is, Who Told You That? And it's the first question that we're going to look at. Who told you that? Before we get into the message, let me pray for us. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done. God, we thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is a lamp into our feet, light into our path. I pray that's exactly what it would be for us today. Whether you're in the room or joining us online, if you pray this with me, God, if you speak, I'll listen. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. I remember uh, one of the first times that my sister and I uh, had a, uh, a babysitter. And it wasn't someone that we knew. Um, but my mom had hired someone to watch us for a few hours, um, and they didn't know our family that well. They were just there to do a job, and um, and my sister and I, we said two famous lines that um, if you are a parent, you probably have heard them. If you are a kid, you probably have used them, um, but as soon as this sitter got there and our mom left, we said, oh, you know, our, our mom lets us do this, right? And then we used the second one and we said, you you know, she said it's okay if we do this, right? And so the sitter who doesn't know us that well is left with a dilemma, right? She has to figure out is what these kids tell me, is it true? And she doesn't want to reach out to my mom because she doesn't want to pester my mom who's paid her to do a job, but she has a decision to make. And I can tell you for a fact that what we told her that my mom said we could do and that she lets us do was, couldn't be further from the truth. But we saw an opportunity and we took advantage of that opportunity. But the reason the sitter needed to know is because she had to do something and she didn't just have to do something, she didn't have to defend that decision. But it's hard to take the right action on wrong information. And this happens in all sorts of contexts, right? If you were at work, uh, maybe there's a situation and the boss said we should be focusing on this. And a coworker says, well, did he really say that, right? Or the teacher, uh, your kid comes home and they say, well, the teacher said I didn't really have to do this assignment. How many parents have heard that before, right? And you're looking at your kid like, "Did, did your teacher really say that? Right? Or maybe um, it was, hey, my husband said it was okay for you to borrow this. Did he really say it was okay for them to borrow that car? Right? 
Some of you are like, dang, how do you know my life? Oh my gosh, right? Maybe you've been a part of a, a wedding party or, or planning a wedding and, and someone hears <laughs> someone say, well, the bride says she doesn't really care about that detail. I'm sure she does not care about that detail for her wedding, right? And for some of us, uh, it, it's, it's not that we don't trust the person who's saying it. Some of you don't trust the person that's saying it. Uh, but the problem is, is the information you're getting isn't consistent with the character of that individual who said it. And for some of us, our first impulse is, why are they lying? Why are they lying? But maybe what they're doing isn't spiteful or intentional. Maybe they genuinely misheard or misunderstood, right? If uh, you ask someone who's touching you, hey, why are you touching me? And they said, well, you told me to bring the tickles. And he said, no, 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 I told you to bring the pickles. <laughs> Right? They just re literally misheard you or misunderstood you. Right? Maybe the way they changed the wording changed the meaning. Right? Someone, you're in a conversation with someone, and they all of a sudden just yell at you, WTF? And you're like, oh my gosh, what did I do? And you're confused. And then they look at you, and they're like, no, 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 working through faith, working through faith. And you're like, that is not what that means. Right? That's not, that's not what they mean, that means, right? Maybe they're relaying their assumption, not the actual information, right? Some of us are in conversations and we hear, uh, we tell someone, hey, he said he wants a divorce. And you're like, wait, did he really say that? <clears throat> no, technically what he said was, he don't want to go to your house for Christmas. But we all know what that means, right? And so regardless of, of how you got the wrong information, it still had an unfortunate impact on your decisions and actions. And if you've ever been misled for a long time and then all of a sudden someone corrects you, it feels like a light bulb moment. And we either appreciate the insight or we lament the wasted time. And that's sort of what happens in the story in Genesis. And the first question God asks us that we all wrestle with. The Bible opens with a narrative poem about God creating the universe handcrafting a garden. He places two humans in it. He tells them to care for, cultivate, and enjoy the garden. He sets one boundary for them. He says, whatever you do, as you enjoy this garden, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or you'll die. And so they exist happily within this boundary, enjoying paradise for a long stretch of time. And then a talking snake appears. And because it's a poem, anything can happen. And it's also a signal to us, though, as readers, that we should be paying more attention to what this interaction means rather than getting hung up on the fact that there's a snake talking to them. I think so often for many of us who um, are reading the Bible, trying to understand the Bible and studying the Bible, I think so often we actually miss the meaning because we get hung up on little details like a snake talking to people. When the intention of the snake talking to the people is to really help us as readers and people trying to understand and pull out what the text actually means, it's a signal for us to lean into and to focus on this interaction rather than being a detail that we would get hung up on and miss the actual meaning. But look at what Genesis 3 uh, verse 1b, it says this, one day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? And so the first question is, he didn't really say that. Are you sure you heard him right? And the woman says, I think I heard him right. He says, if we don't listen to his direction, we will die. Look at what verses four through five, it says this. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. In other words, God can't really be trusted. That's what the serpent is trying to convince the woman of. Right? Maybe God knows that once you eat from this tree that you'll be just as smart, powerful, and capable as him, and so you won't need him anymore. Maybe God is just a little bit insecure. But the man and the woman, they have no experience of God that would actually lead them to believe that what the serpent is saying is true. But that's what I find so interesting about words, is that we can hear something, and then it takes root in our mind, and even though it's not reality, it starts to feel real. That as something that is not true, not reality, sets, takes root in our mind, it starts to feel true and become true for us. And this is what happened with the woman in the story. Look at what verse 6 says. It says, the woman was convinced. 
She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband. See, that's what it says. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> just kidding. She gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. He didn't have to eat it. Um, but here's the reality. We all do this. We all do exactly what they did. We know something is not healthy for us, not good for us, but it looks so beautiful, it looks so delicious, and we want it. Look at what verse seven says. It says this, at that moment, their eyes were open and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. And I think so often, for those of you that have been in church for some time now, we've read this verse wrong. It doesn't say that they realized they were naked. It says that they felt shame about their nakedness. So listen to this. They didn't have clothes on and all of a sudden they eat from the tree and their clothes just magically fall off. No, no, no. So they didn't actually change. They were already naked. So they didn't change. Their perception of themselves changed. The way they saw themselves changed. And so instead of living their lives from a place of unconditional love, acceptance, and trust, they began to see everything through a lens of self-consciousness, insecurity, suspicion. And this started to be what steered their life. It started to be the thing that guided everything that they did, how they related with one another, how they saw the world, how they saw themselves and their lives. And eventually, too, We start to see everything through the thoughts that implant themselves in our minds that we can't shake. First, it's just a statement. And then that statement becomes a thought. And that thought becomes an idea. And that idea becomes a perspective. And finally, that perspective becomes a filter, meaning everything we see and hear passes through that filter for interpretation. And I want to give you some that I see all the time. The first one, and you can write these down. The first one is performance, which says, I'm not doing enough. And this leads us to believe that I should be doing more or better. I should be working harder or faster. And achievement determines my value or my worth. The second one that I see all the time is permanence, which says, I can't change. And it leads us to believe that what's the point? Nothing ever works. I always end up right back where I started. The next one that I see all the time is pessimism, which says I'm doomed anyway. And it leads us to believe that anything good is just an illusion. Everybody's got a selfish angle. Everybody's out to get me. No one has good intentions with me. Everything good will fall apart. Pity, which says I don't deserve anything good. And it leads us to believe I'm not good enough, smart enough, skilled enough, or skinny enough for anything that I want. And lastly, pride, which says I'm better than them and leads us to believe that people are idiots and I can't trust anyone but myself. And everyone has something that makes them less than me. And this is why a handful of people can experience the same exact situation but walk away thinking, feeling, about and interpreting it in totally different ways. None of us have unfiltered experiences. Everything that you experience in life, everything that you hear, everything that you see, everything that you do is getting filtered through something. And it's the reason that you think about it a certain way. It's the reason you feel about it a certain way. It's the reason you interpret it a certain way. Look at what Proverbs 23, verse seven, it says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. See, as he thinks in his heart. And so whatever we allow into our heart is going to ultimately become our filter. In behavior, one who manipulates, he says to you, eat and drink, yet his heart is not with you. But it is begrudging the cost. In other words, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Anything anyone says to you filters through what you say to you. Anything anyone says to you filters through what you say to you. And we all hear a lot of things, but we don't internalize them all. We don't um, tuck them away all in our hearts. It's not possible. But the problem is some of us have internalized 
the wrong voice, the wrong thoughts, the wrong perspectives. And it matters what we meditate on because what we meditate on becomes the filter through how we see everything in the world around us. Because not everything that comes into our ears was meant to get to our heart. And for many of us, we have allowed things that weren't true, aren't real, to come into our ears, settle down into our hearts, and now we are filtering everything and anything that someone says to us, does to us, through that filter. Look at what Proverbs 4, verse 23, it says this, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Because God knows that whatever gets into here, oh my gosh, it will drive everything that happens in how we live. And what we meditate on matters, what we ruminate on matters. Man, can I tell you, um, over the last, uh, really over the last few weeks, um, there's something new that has been happening to me that's never happened to me before in my life, and I had to talk to my therapist about it, but I started to have anxiety attacks. And the first question that my therapist asked me, um, she said, what are you thinking about when it happens? And I immediately told her what I was thinking about. And she said, well, how long are you thinking about it? I told her how long it was ruminating in my mind. And she said, that's your trigger. So what I meditate on matters. And so, man, I, I can tell you that, like, I can literally feel it coming on. But it all starts with what I'm meditating on. And so what do we do, right? How do we actually go about changing the way that we think? Is it possible, right? I think the people in the Genesis story, they let their guard down and allowed something they heard from someone they didn't even know to worm its way into their hearts and it became the filter for their decision making. Because of that, they made some bad decisions and God shows up into the garden. Look at what Genesis 3, verse 9 through 11 it says this. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Verse 11, who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. And that's the question we all have to wrestle with. Who told you that? Who told you that? God is saying you're acting on a perspective that did not come from me. Where did it come from? Does that person have the right to tell you who you are? And some of you are acting on certain words, phrases, or perspectives that were handed to you, maybe have come to define you, but they're actually not true. You can overpower the truth with a lie if you repeat it enough. And for many of us, that's what we've done. But I wonder where that lie came from. The prominent external voices from your childhood often become the primary internal voices in adulthood. And so maybe it came from a parent, maybe it came from a coach, maybe it came from a teacher, maybe it came from someone that had influence in your life when you were a kid, and it's possible this person wasn't trying to be mean to you. Maybe they were genuinely trying to do the best that they could with what they had and help you grow, mature, and understand the reality, but that's not quite how you received it. And because it's not how you received it, what's happened over time is their voice has become your voice. What they said about you has become what you say about you. What they believed about you has become what you believe about you. And so some of our voices, they couldn't sound less like Jesus, and here's the real downside of that. And if you're taking notes, here's our big idea today. You interpret life according to the voices you internalize. You interpret life according to the voices you internalize. And man, can I tell you, this happens all, to all of us. It happens to me all the time. I know there are some Sundays uh, uh, when we finish services and someone comes up to me and they say, man, I, I just I really enjoyed that message. You know what I hear sometimes? That was terrible. I could have done better. Why didn't I do better? That's what I hear. Because of voices that have become, that started as external voices that become primary internal voices for me. Just this morning, 8.30 service, 10 o'clock service, 
I've had so many people come up to me and they say, man, I really like that, I really like that sweater, that cardigan. And if you did that, thank you. Like genuinely, sincerely, thank you. But you know what I actually heard? Does this actually look good on me? Because when I put it on, my wife said, uh. <laughs> But again, the reason I share that is external voice becoming an internal voice, whether it's true or not. Right, so how, how I receive something, even a compliment that you said, I can hear it completely differently. Right, and that's what we have to understand. We interpret life according to the voices you internalize. This is why for some of us, when someone says, hey, that's really great work, I would only tweak this one thing. What you hear is, I'm a piece of crap. I suck at my job, I'm terrible. I'm never gonna be good enough. And some of you in the room, that's been your experience. Some of you walk into a room with your boss and you get a raise. And because the internal voice is so bad, you walk out feeling defeated, even though they just gave you a raise. And so it matters, right? And so how do we, how do we change what that internal voice is? Well, first, you've got to figure out what does your and who does your inner voice remind you of? What does it tell you? Does it sound different in different situations? Is it friendly? Is it critical? Is it more complimentary, caring, or, and constructive, or discouraging, defeating, and demeaning? And this is what God was asking Adam and Eve in the garden. Does this thought that you're building your life off of sound like me? And it's a rhetorical question because as soon as they examine it, they realize that's not who God is. Or how God talks, which brings up a great question. How does God talk? What does he sound like? He sounds just like Jesus. Look at what Hebrews 1, 1 through 2a, it says this. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. Verse 2a, and now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. God wouldn't say anything to you that conflicts with what Jesus has already said to us. God would not say anything to you that conflicts with what Jesus has already said to us. And what God is trying to get Adam and Eve to understand and realize is that if we don't allow God to change the way that we think, we will continue to sabotage the way that we live. Notice, I did not say that God would continue to sabotage the way that we live. We would continue to sabotage the way that we live if we don't allow God to change the way that we think. And so how do we stop thinking a certain way? One of the things I've learned in therapy over the years is you can't just replace a destructive thought. Like, you can't just erase it. It needs to be replaced with something. So as you're processing something with a therapist or a counselor or someone that trusts, it's not just about getting rid of that thing, it's about what am I now filling that hole with? What am I filling that space with? What am I filling that place in my mind, and my heart? What am I filling it with? That's the whole purpose of cognitive therapy, internalizing a better inner voice, and this idea is all over the Bible. Second Corinthians 10, five, one of my favorite examples of this, it says this, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought. It's not about just taking captive that thought, but it's also about making that thought obedient to Christ, meaning, let me take this thought that I have, not just hold on to it, take it captive, but does this line up with who God says I am? Does this line up with who Jesus says I am? Does this line up with what Jesus believes about me? A lot of us, we want to, but we don't know how, and so how do we just stop thinking a certain way, replacing those thoughts, not just erasing those thoughts. I met with a student a couple weeks ago, and um, you know they were just talking to me about um, some challenges they were having, and, and uh, one of the things that they had mentioned to me was just, man, like I have a hard time, um, just have a hard time lying. And I looked at him, I said, every person does. I was like, I remember when I was your age, oh my gosh, it was so hard to tell the truth. And... Um, I also told him, I said, man, let me tell you, once you lie once, you gotta keep lying. And eventually, it's gonna end. But I, he's, he's, he said to me, he said, I, I, he's like, even today, I prayed. I prayed to God. 
God, would you help me not to lie? And I heard that and I said, man, I love, first of all, I love the desire that you have to change. There's a willingness that you want to be different. You want to live different. But I said, even in how you pray, I wonder if you're still giving too much power to the thing that you don't want to do. Listen to how you prayed. You said, God, would you help me not to lie? There's still so much focus on the thing that you don't want to do. I said, why don't you just change how you pray this week? Instead of praying, God, would you help me not to lie? What if you pray, God, would you help me to be honest? Would you help me to be truthful? And so now the focus is not on what he doesn't want to do. The focus becomes on the thing that he wants to do. And so that's what we're getting at when we're talking about allowing God to change the way that we think. And so imagine if you interpreted everything everyone said to or about you through what Jesus has already said to or about you. Think of how much less insecure you'd be, how much less defensive, how much less anxious, how much less angry, and imagine how that would change how you experience everyone and everything else. And so how do we do that? I wanna give us four things we can do real quick as Deshaun comes back to join me. The first one is this, read and reread scripture, specifically the stories and sayings of Jesus. If we want Jesus to become our inner voice, we got to know what he's saying and what he sounds like. And so if you need a place, a starting point, start in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and just read them over and over and over and over and over and over and over again so that you can become familiar with who Jesus is and what Jesus says. The second thing is frequently put yourself around people who echo the voice of Jesus to you. Not that you can't be around people who don't, but you gotta have a circle of people that sound like Jesus to you, that are not gonna just sound like Jesus to you, but they're gonna remind you of who Jesus is and what he said about you. The third thing is ask yourself what Jesus would say or do in this situation in front of you. And lastly, pray that Jesus would not just erase, but replace your unhealthy inner voice with his own. But can I tell you, all of this starts with that first one. If we don't know his voice, it will be impossible to replace anything that needs to be replaced. And so just start in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And honestly, like you could spend eternity there. That's where we start to understand who Jesus is, what he sounds like, and who he says we are. Look at what Matthew 11, verse 15, it says this, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Listen and not just hear it, but internalize it and live your life based on it. Or is what God is saying to you being overpowered by what you're saying to you? And if so, what you have to figure out is who told you that? Who told you that? Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done. God, we thank you for the truth in your word. Pray that as we leave this place, God, that you would help us, help us wrestle honestly with what is the inner voice that has been guiding and shaping how I live and how I see and how I hear. And if it's not your voice, God, would you help us to have the courage to do the work, to make your voice be the loudest thing that we hear? Help us to be able to discern, God, what comes into our ears and what to allow into our hearts and what to simply let pass through. We thank you that you are a good, gracious, loving, and faithful God. And as we leave this place today, would you help us to shine your light in the darkest of places wherever you have us? And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. Church, we love you. We'll see you next week. South Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that he's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents and abilities 
abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because a Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that He can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.